Welcome to this time of worship with our Presbyterian faith community based in Endicott, New York. This is a day when each of us can remember our baptism. As the new year gets underway, we can recall that we are called God's beloved children, welcomed and encouraged to be a part of Jesus' work among the people he loves so much. Welcome to the journey of faith. We are so glad you are with us. Eternal God, at the baptism of Jesus in the River Jordan, you proclaimed him your beloved son and anointed him with the Holy Spirit. Grant that all who are baptized in his name might keep our covenant with you, boldly confessing Jesus the Christ as Lord and Savior. Amen. See the Son of Bethlehem, of shepherds watching there, and of the news that came to them from angels in the air. The light that shone on Bethlehem fills all the world today. Of Jesus' birth and peace on earth, the angels sing away. Oh, sing a song of Nazareth, of sunny days of joy. Oh, sing of fragrant flowers' breath, and of the sinless boy. For Flowers of Nazareth in every heart may grow. Now spreads the fame of his dear name on all the winds that blow. Oh, sing a song of Galilee, of lake and woods and hill, of him who walked upon the sea and bade the waves be still. For though dark waves on Galilee, dark seas of trouble roll. When faith has heard the Master's word, falls peace upon the soul. Every day we begin again. Let us begin the journey of following Jesus by trusting God in God's grace. Gracious God, in baptism you promise forgiveness and new life, and you make us one in the body of Christ. And yet, we remain preoccupied with ourselves, separated from one another in more ways than one. We cling to destructive habits, hold grudges, and are reluctant to welcome one another. We allow the past to hold us captive, In your loving kindness, free us from all that keeps us from openness to you. In your spirit, let us rise to new life so that we might live together in your grace. We pause now for a time of silent prayer. We are grateful that neither death, nor life, nor present things, nor things to come, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us share the peace with those who are near and also those who are in your thoughts. A reading from the very beginning of the Bible, beginning at Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light, 
and God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. Happy New Year. It's really good to see you in the year 2021. Wow. It's a new year. We get pretty excited about new things. It can be fun to have a new pair of shoes or a new backpack at the beginning of the school year. It can be fun to have a new toy. I always enjoy having a new phone every couple of years, which is my idea of a fun new toy. The passage from scripture that Mr. McDonald just read for us is about the moment when everything was new. I mean, everything, the whole universe. God had just created light. It's hard to imagine, isn't it? Only darkness and the sound of rushing water, and then God speaks, and light is born. And the passage I'm going to read in a minute, that's about John the Baptist inviting people who wish they could feel new inside, like they want to stop doing the things they've been doing and try something new, something better, something that makes God happy and helps them to feel happy too. Did you ever feel that way? Like you wanted to do better, but you just couldn't figure out how? This is something that happens to everyone, so you're not alone. John was helping people feel better by baptizing them. Did you know that? And that makes sense because baptism reminds us of some really wonderful things. First, it helps us to know that God loves us and always welcomes us back even when we know we've been doing the wrong thing. God loves us and forgives us. And baptism reminds us that there's a group of people that cares about us that's even bigger than our family. It's all the people of the church. We're all connected to one another, but not because we're related like cousins. We're connected to one another because we love God and we want to follow Jesus. It's a little bit like having another big family looking out for us. How wonderful to know that all these people care for us and are connected to us. Do you remember your baptism? I have baptized quite a few of you. And I know if you were a baby or still pretty little when you were baptized, you probably don't remember that day. But if you were a little older or even an adult, you might remember. I'm going to suggest something that might sound a little weird, but I want you to try it. It's a way you can remember your baptism, not remember what it was like, but remember that you were baptized. The next time you are washing your hands, and we wash our hands all the time now, right? The next time you're washing your hands, remember that you were washed in the waters of baptism. You can even say a prayer while you're washing them. You might say, thank you for the water, God. Thanks for feeling new. Thank you for your love for me. Help me to love you. What do you think? Are you willing to try it? The next time you turn on the water to wash your hands, remember to thank God for your baptism. Let's have a prayer. Dear God, 
Thank you for the waters of baptism. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for welcoming us. Help us to share your love every day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope you have a wonderful week. I really love seeing you here. A reading from the Gospel according to Mark, beginning at chapter 1, verse 1. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. Holy Wisdom, Holy Word, thanks be to God. You know that feeling you get when you're reading something or maybe listening to someone speak and you realize they're talking to you. Not in your mind, not in your imagination, but really to you directly. I imagine that's what it was like in the year 70 or so to be among the listeners when the writer we call Mark first performed this gospel for groups of Christians, or as they called themselves, followers of the way. It's hard to imagine church before there were gospels. Before Mark wrote this gospel, there were collections of sayings of Jesus, but no miracle stories had been told. There were letters filled with teachings about Jesus, who he was, what his life meant, but no actions recorded for people to hear about. And if this gospel is anything, this main gospel we will be reading this year, it's a story of action. It's a story of Jesus in which he teaches, but he also moves. He goes to the River Jordan to be baptized and then to the wilderness to be tested. He goes to Galilee to share the good news God has revealed to him, in word and in deed. And eventually, he goes to Jerusalem to take the cup that God has prepared for him. And that's Mark's gospel, a gospel of action, raw and propulsive. Let's start at the very beginning. The first sentence of this gospel is its title. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. From the beginning, Mark wants us to know who Jesus is. And he's actually told us three important things here. First, the story of Jesus is a story of good news. In a time and place, the Holy Land 2,000 years ago, occupied by a brutal empire, good news was in pretty short supply. In fact, Caesar regularly sent around appalling letters to these territories, recounting the victories won, new lands taken over, 
body counts. And these letters were sent under guess what title? Right you are. Good news. So for Mark to open this little book with a title that uses that word, it's more than a little cheeky. Second, Mark calls Jesus the Christ. If you're like me, you grew up thinking Christ was Jesus' surname. Later on, I found out it was the same word as Messiah, which means anointed. To be anointed is to be chosen for a specific task, a calling, really. In scripture, prophets are anointed, and temple priests are anointed, and kings are anointed. Jesus is anointed, which means God has something important for him to do. And third, Mark calls Jesus Son of God. This is also just a little sassy on his part, since Caesar was also known as Son of God. And I think you're getting the gist. Mark just isn't having it when it comes to Caesar. The brutal, vain leader of the Roman Empire can call himself Son of God till the cows come home, and it won't hold a candle to the one whose story Mark is about to tell us. Here's the real deal. The real Son of God. And here's where Mark's original audience would have felt their Jesus-y, spidey senses tingling. All those words about way. A messenger will prepare your way, says the prophet. He will cry out, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. As people who understand themselves to be followers of the way of Jesus, they will recognize themselves. That's their way he's talking about. The good news is about the way to which they have already committed their lives. Jesus encounters John, who is out baptizing people in the wild. Jesus wades out into the River Jordan and offers himself for this Jewish purification ritual that John has tied to repentance. Repentance translates a word that has nothing to do with remorse or feeling bad about yourself, just as sin translates a word that has nothing to do with evil intention or action. When we read sin, the author means something like missing the mark. It's an archery term. Getting off the path, wandering from the way, perhaps. And when we read repentance, the author means turning around, finding the way, or finding your way back to the way. And so Jesus is baptized. And for a brief moment, we're given an image, the young man in the water up to his hips, grizzled caveman prophet grasping him and helping him to fall back into the flowing current. And as he is coming up out of the water, the thing we have prayed for happens. Remember? It was six weeks ago, to be exact, 42 days. We read from the prophet Isaiah a passage that expressed how desperately God's people wanted God's intervention in the world they lived in. The passage began, Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down. That passage addressed people who were at the end of their ropes, who had lost faith and hope, and wondered where in all the ways their world had been turned upside down was God. I am guessing many of us felt that way this week, as we were glued to our phones and our screens, watching as the horror of an attack on our government unfolded. An attack from our own, not the brown-skinned foreigners we so like to blame. White supremacy is ever with us, because this was an inside job, complete with Nazi flags and flags of the Confederacy. It was too terrible to believe, and yet we watched it happen. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down and fix this. Oh, that God would do that, fix this, 
convince everyone of the truth. I know I feel that way today. I imagine you feel that way, even if you believe the exact opposite of what I believe to be true. Can we get God to please fix this? In Jesus, in a strange and probably complicated way, God fixes this. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my son the Beloved, in you I am well pleased. In Jesus, God has torn open the heavens and come down. Jesus is very directly the answer to prayer, to our prayer, and whether for you that means you have found your Lord, or your Savior, or your Shepherd, or your Teacher, or your healer, only you can say. But Jesus is the answer to that prayer. A voice speaks, the voice of God, affirming that Jesus is in fact God's child, who participates in God's purest being, radically at one with God, and at the same time, a human being with dark brown skin a member of an oppressed minority. You are my child, the voice says. You are my beloved. And that is the very same thing God says to each of us, sooner or later. You are mine, God says. You are my beloved. I don't believe anyone who truly knows themselves to be God's beloved child, would be capable of what we saw unfold in our nation's capital this week. No one who understands how radically God loves them would be capable of that kind of violence or violation. Writer Richard Rohr reminds us that love is at the heart of understanding who we really are, who God created us to be. He writes, Your true self is who you always have been in God, and at its core, it is love itself. Love is both who you are and who you are still becoming, like a sunflower seed that becomes its own sunflower. There's nothing you can do to make God love you more, and there's nothing you can do to make God love you less. All you can do is nurture your true self. It is love becoming love in this unique form called me. As Mark says, this is just the beginning of the good news God has in store for you, for all of us. God sees the mess. God hears our distress and so tears open the heavens to whisper in our ears those healing words. You are beloved. You are mine. And that makes all the difference. Thanks be to God. Amen. the 
souls that are stumbling in darkness, why do we sleep in the light? Jesus commands us to go make disciples. This is our cause. This is the fight. Go forth in his name, proclaiming Jesus reigns. Now is the time for the church to arise and proclaim him, Jesus, Savior, Redeemer, and Lord. Listen, the wind of the Spirit is blowing, the end of the age is so near. Powers in the earth and the heavens are shaking, Jesus our We approach God in prayer, not as strangers, but as beloved children, one in Christ Jesus. Let us pray together. Loving God, you cause rain to fall on the just and the unjust. Hear our prayers for your church and your world. For the hungry and the overfed, may we have enough. For the mourners and the mockers, May we laugh together. For the victims and the oppressors, may we share power wisely. For the peacemakers and the warmongers, may clear truth and stern love lead us to harmony. For the silenced and the propagandists, may we speak our own words in truth. For the unemployed and the overworked, especially for all the essential workers who continue to put their lives on the line so that others may live. May our mark on this earth be kindly and creative. For the troubled and the secure, may we live together as wounded healers. For the homeless and the pampered, may all know the dignity of safety and security. For the vibrant and the dying, may we know the life abundant that can only be found in knowing we are loved by you. To close, a prayer from the Presbyterian Book of Common Worship, a prayer for a time of national strife. God of ages, in your sight nations rise and fall and pass through times of peril. Now, when our land is troubled, be near to judge and save. May leaders be led by your wisdom. May they search for your will and see it clearly. If we have turned from your way, help us to reverse our ways and repent. Give us your light and your truth to guide us, through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of this world and our Savior. In his holy name we pray as he taught us, debtors, trespassers, and sinners together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Christ within me, Christ 
We are God's own beloved children. Any offering we bring, any service, such as the service of the deacons and elders who will be installed in just a few minutes, any statement about who we are in God's sight begins there. As we give, let us give with gratitude. Let us pray. We give you thanks and praise, O God, that you have claimed us in baptism and poured the gifts of your Spirit upon us. By that same Spirit, empower us to love and serve you. Let the gifts we bring help us to bear the good news of Jesus to a world that so badly needs it. We pray in the name of your beloved Son. Amen. Go into the rest of this day and week in peace. Have courage. Hold fast to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord your God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit be with each and all of us, this day and forevermore. God is with us, so go in peace. Thanks be to God. Amen.